On this week's episode of Defense with DC, we're going to talk about halftime adjustments and we'll look at the Georgia and Tennessee game, talk about man coverage in closed middle of the field, playing some cloud coverage to the field quarters away, and handling things with the four eyes to set the edge. And then we'll take a look at the option game in Army versus Air Force. And joining me as he always does to discuss some defense and learn from the games that we saw is Dan Carroll. Defensive coordinator of the USFL Michigan Panthers. Dan, great to be back for another week of Talking Ball. Yeah, Keith, great to be here, man. Great weekend of football. I saw a lot of great games, great players, great coaching going on. Can't wait to talk about it. So we're going to take a look first at halftime adjustments. And I think for some teams, this can be glossed over very quickly in how this is handled. And I really believe, number one, this starts with having a procedure. And so if you're home, that's something that should be consistent all year long. You should know how long it takes you to get from the field to your locker room, when those meetings are going to start. Everybody should know the format for their meetings, where they're going to meet with their position coach, who's up first, uh, when the coaches are going to get together, etc. And I know when we'd go on the road then, a lot of times if you've been at those places before, you already know what that's going to look like. We could talk to your players about it beforehand. Usually we would still run over it with them when we would get there that this is how halftime is going to work because a lot of times, you know, it doesn't matter the level, you're going to have new guys there. And if we'd never been there, the first thing we do is scope it out. And after we figured out what our procedures are going to be as coaches, we'd share that with the players. So I think that just sets up the framework for it so that you can be very efficient because depending on the level, you have anywhere from 10 to 20 minutes and you take away the the walk to the field and back and all those things that go into it. It's going to be less time than that. Yeah, certainly. I mean, I think a lot of things play into the amount of time you get. If the offense is ending the half with the ball, we're certainly going to do that, right? Your, your guys from the box can get down quicker. or Maybe the coordinator's in the box and can get down quicker. Like all those little things that you can steal a couple minutes are really important. And I just shared with you a little bit. When you talk about just efficiency and trying to steal time, I would always have the meeting a little differently based on whether we were getting the ball or kicking the ball coming out in the third quarter. If we're receiving the ball, I'm going to spend a little more time with the staff and be a little bit more thorough and in-depth and with everybody in there. Typically, we're going to gather, like you said, in a spot that we predetermined, you know, a shower or a bathroom or something. And we're going to stay in there and we're going to talk a little bit more and have a little bit more in-depth conversation about what we can build, knowing that if we can't get everything coached up in halftime, we have the drive of the offense and the kickoff and, and those things, you know, to make sure we get the finer details, talk to with the players. But, you know, that staff time between you and the coaches is really important, right? And so it's important about just what adjustments can we make and what does the staff feel comfortable with based on what we practice, based on what we're doing in the game, based on what the offense is doing in the game. So you know, a couple of things I think about a lot, if there's a way, if we need to make an adjustment, something that happens, you know, we, we're traditionally in most of my career split safety operation, more than, you know, 75% of our first and second down is probably some version of split safety defense. So if somebody is relentlessly attacking the middle and we did not rep a ton of cover three, we didn't, we didn't have a, a, a big plan to play middle field closed. Maybe we have a, a well-developed fire zone game plan that, that game. So that might be how we have to close the middle. So I'm a big proponent when we get in at halftime is we're going to address our problems with things that we've practiced. However, we got to do that. Maybe those aren't situations we would be blitzing in normally, but we're going to look at, all right, they are attacking the middle on second and medium or anytime they're taking a shot, it's going deep middle, deep middle. We didn't rep enough cover three this week. or We didn't rep enough one high man stuff this week. So how do we close the middle? Well, we have fire zone in. So we might be calling fire zones in situations we didn't expect to, just to get the middle closed, right? Because that's something we're at, that's something we're comfortable with. It's not installing something at halftime when you don't have to. So that's one way and one example to get that done. If we get open side runs and we don't have a stunt to cut the front to an open side run, maybe it is a pressure, right? Maybe it's a pressure that we, that we can come off the open side. And now that gives us the same type of action to get those balls bounced sideways because we got the line moving that way as opposed to, you know, guys, we're going to run a pirate or we're going to run a, up and under stunt or some type of, of stunt to, to kill an open side run. Okay. So we might already have a blitz built in and we'll just call that. But the biggest thing I want to do is I want to find a way to address the problems with what we've already practiced, what we already have in the game plan. And a lot of times that's going to be calling something in a situation, in a down and distance, or even maybe versus a personnel group that we didn't anticipate. And that's fine. We're just going to get the players dialed into it. And we got to make sure that something we feel good about running the rest of the game. 
Best you can. Second point, best you can. No new coverages. No new coverages. I won't say we haven't had to do that at times, but best you can, no new coverage. I think the hardest thing and to get the details worked out of every possible route, everything you could see is installing, I say installing, but going back to a coverage that you've played in the past that didn't rep for the week, right? Something you haven't prepared, something you haven't seen against, this team splits, this team's route, this team's two-man combinations, this team's three-man combinations. You know, you might not have it worked out to empty. You might not have it worked out to cross motion or fly motion, like all these little nuances that you would have worked out if you had the coverage in in the week. To me, right, it's important. And I'm not saying that it can be 100%. Sometimes you got to do what you got to do and you got to get all the details worked out on the sideline. But as best you can, right, do no new coverages. No new coverages, absolute best you can. Other thing is that you have that process for halftime, right? People are bringing you information down. The biggest things that you want to look at, biggest things I want to look at, I want to see the, I want to get some semblance of a formational hit chart, and especially any formation that's given us problems. Okay, formations, shifts, motions that have given us problems. And the distribution, I've talked on here before about distributions. Even so, it's probably more important to me. Like, what are the distributions where they're making yards in the ball? What are the distributions where they're making yards throwing? I want to come down and get these distributions right in these formations so we can coach the players on this stuff. Like, this is what we're seeing these runs out of. Right, and this is what we're seeing these throws out of. So that information has got to typically come down from the press box. I don't typically go to the press box. Some coordinators might. You might be making those notes as you go as a coordinator. That's great that you feel comfortable up there. You know, from that standpoint, I don't want to take an aside from halftime adjustments, but to me, based on whether I go up or down, is, is this. The number one thing you have to have during the game is communication to the players. So if you feel like there's somebody on your staff that can communicate with the players, then you should probably go up. If you feel like nobody can communicate with the players the way you can, and that's the reason you stay down, right? I've stayed down mostly in my career. In different circumstances, I would certainly look at it differently. But that's my thoughts and beliefs. The number one thing is communication with the players. The number two thing is eyes on the offense and eyes on the whole product, right? But you've got to communicate with the players more importantly, in my opinion. Well, second, but just, you, you get that down from the box. You get that information. You get you get your hit charts. You get the, the stuff that's hurting you based on formation. And then you've got to come up with – couple of adjustments that you can make to, to stop the bleeding, right? stop the run game, stop the pass game, whatever it is that's hurting you. Right? What pressures can you get on third down? Right? The other thing is start to limit the menu. Right? Start to peel back the menu a little bit, especially your third down, your situational menus. We ran this blitz twice. It did not get home. All right? We're good. We're going to focus on these two. So coach the guys back up. Hey, our third and long pressures are going to be these two moving forward. We didn't like this coverage versus what they're doing. We're going to go to this one. So if you have the time, if you have the efficiency throughout the first half, you want to be able to start to trim the menu, okay? But I think it's important as you're teaching, coaching the players half time and teaching them what's coming, attacking the formations, getting the guys dialed back into. I know we rep this, this, and this this week, but really what they're showing us is a little bit different. It's here and here. And then the last thing, I've found it much easier than you might think to create formational blitzes as the games went on. The players tend to pick that stuff up easier than, than I maybe would have thought in the past. So, you know, if you think that, hey, we're running this blitz or this blitz, maybe we can get a check check it in there, or we can you know, run this blitz to a different formation than we said we were going to run it to, like formational pressures and using those pressures that you already have built in, but now saying, hey, I'm, I'm going to call this as check and I want to bring it you know, to the tight end, away from the tight end, to passing strength away, whatever. And I think those are the things that you can really get some gas on as the game goes that aren't that expensive for the players. Right? It might feel like it's some communication that's got to take place, generally feel like that's a lot easier to do than start installing new things. You know, those are just a couple of things we look for at halftime. Those are some of the things that, you know, from a process and organization standpoint of getting everybody together. Assistant coaches went through with the players. Hey, we're going to meet here at halftime as a defense. Coach breaks us up. Our position group's going to go here. We're going to talk about this, this, and this as much as we have time for. If we need more time, we're going to get back together on the sideline as soon as the, uh, we go back out for the third quarter. But – you know, just finding the, the little adjustments you can make without going through too much is, is super important. It's interesting you bring up putting in some formational checks at halftime. I know anytime I would look at a game plan, one, we would start with what do we know about this team and, and, and how they're going to line up. But then from there, we would develop some things formationally that may give them some different looks. And, you know, the first thing we're looking at is – this is what we expected based on what we saw that they would line up this way. And then we're looking at 
what are they doing in this? Now, because usually we hadn't shown things like that, we don't get formational checks in that particular game. But I'd agree with you. Like, to me, and having coached in the defensive side of the ball before, that's not necessarily something that's difficult to do, though I just don't see a lot of people doing that. That I, I've, at least myself, never really experienced that, that all of a sudden now, second half, run that formation, and all of a sudden we're getting some some checks to it every time we run it. But I do think it's a, a very valuable tool, and I would agree that it's it's inexpensive to do something like that. Yeah, I think that most of the guys that have, have played for me and in the system that we've been in, we install blitzes by name, and we rep them, and we run them in training camp, and they have names. And, and what the reality is, as the season goes, they're going to be named – something check right and it's going to be a formation it's going to be a player it's going to be something that we're going to blitz and take advantage of you know it's, it's going to be one of those things where if the backs are paired or if they're different or if it's fsl or if it's any you know more for college situation than pro hashes but we're going to take advantage of some situation that comes up and we're going to want to pressure a specific place so we have all these names for these pressures but almost never do you call in that pressure you call it in based on a it's tight end check or it's off check or it's whatever right and so when you get in that mentality that most of the time the pressures are going to be where they're coming from is going to be handled on the field based on the look we're going to get then it makes it really simple to go in and say all right i know we were bringing this in 12 personnel at the wings but the run plays have been different we want to bring them to the open side now any number of things like that that can come up in a game but when you've already set the expectation that you have blitzes that are built to attack certain things and players understand that we're going to learn these pressures but the reality is when it comes game time they're going to be called on the field as to what we're coming to and then that's a lot of cases that's the same with our base defenses right when you play especially when you play variations of split safety coverage and you have all the i say bells and whistles but we you know all the little checks and all the different variations all the leverages and all the the forces that you can play off the split safety defense you're going to play like an auto call or something like that that's going to let you, you know, make those adjustments on the field. So it really ingrains in the players that they have to be communicating pre-snap every time, right? There's going to be something that's got to get communicated to put us in the right call. And I think that those things are so important, especially in the pro game when people are huddling and you have a little more time and you're communicating directly with the guys on the field, you are getting in the right call for that situation, that personnel, that formation, we're getting in the right call. And I want to be in the right blitz. I don't want to be in, a generic blitz. I want to be in the right blitz, right? So let's make sure that we're building it in that way. Once we get it installed, we're starting to build it in that way. Well, moving forward, looking at the Georgia and Tennessee game, a game certainly with a, a lot of hype and expectations and things that you saw in that game that you liked, uh, some things with man coverage, and I know the way that they were playing their four eyes, you liked those as well as a couple other variations in coverage. Yeah, I mean, when you watch the game, I know George has been in those in those big moments, those big situations, but a lot of the guys on the field have been on the sidelines for those moments before. So I do think it's a, a big credit to just George's staff to just be able to, I mean, at the end of the day, just reload with some younger guys and, and have as, as good a team as they have right now. And when they're firing, and I know they've had some games where they probably didn't play as well as they like at times, but when they're firing right now, they are they are something else, and especially on defense, they are something else to watch. And, you know, their secondary play is, is – it's, it's great, it's fundamental, and it's it's very sound, but they also have playmakers that make plays on the football, and, and there's no better trait you can have in the secondary than somebody who can actually make a play on the football. You know, I know speed's great, backpedaling's great, tackling's great, but when the ball is in the air, guys that can go catch it like they have is – uh, trait that is much needed to play great defense but yeah you know we talked on here before uh, just about the Alabama game and how I thought the split manipulations from Tennessee had affected Alabama and you know in some ways just how they felt like Alabama they were playing some cover three when they wanted to go one high they were playing cover three to it and there was a space between you know the curl flat player and hook player and a lot of those balls were finding that seam and you know it just seemed like they were just out leveraged at times but I thought Georgia handled that from a one high perspective played a little more man you know some of it and there were some motions and they were getting out of two by two and it just felt like maybe it was cover three but like we talked about once the splits got so wide they, they were matching it like man and, and I thought that they did a much better job with those wide splits keeping the ball out of kind of out of the alley or out of the crease whatever you want to call that space kind of between the numbers and the hash where, where so many of the balls go when you play those offenses with wide splits because 
again, you're, you're over split with them. And now your backers are still the backers because they're still in the run fit and they're utilizing all that space between, you know, the, the receivers and the, and the box. So I think that playing a lot more man helped them there. They played more too high as well. And they were in a lot more too high. They were in some, they were in some versions of two man. They were in some cloud where it looked like the outside guy was just playing flat and the corner was playing flat. And then the overhang nickel Sam was playing a carry technique you know, they were playing some cloud to strength, you know, 11 personnel pictures where they get truly have the tight end, you know, 20 look where the tight end's in the backfield. He's not in any type of vertical position. Not that I know those guys do send him vertical sometimes through the line, but, you know, for the most part, not sending him vertical in that in those positions. They were playing some version of two or two man out to the field, but none of those guys were counting in the run fit. And then to the boundary, they were in quarters, right? And they're playing, keeping the safety high, but he's still, he's a part of the run fit. And I think that's a coverage that, coverage and a front structure they did it out of tight front and out of four down so they had it both ways i think that's a a coverage that can be really good versus 11 personnel you know it's going to be a similar fit to like one high because you don't have any support player from the strong side or from the field but you know you really put a make it hard for them to run their two-man combinations out there when you're carrying the seam of two with a nickel and then you have a cloud corner and you got a safety over top right there's not a whole lot of two-man combinations you, you know you start to get if you do something like that you typically start to get versions of drive with two vertical and one under you know and you got to get the nickel to pivot off and play it top down the corner got to snap high up top to dig and you know that does become a little bit more difficult but a lot of the, the passing offense in that in that offensive scheme is just like vertical stems and sit routes and stop routes and really if you're in cloud and you're carrying it takes a lot of that away and i think that when they were able to take that away you know verse 11 now the safety Tennessee did some things where they tried to hold, help hold the safety and ran like a little lead draw with the tight end leading through. I thought it was good. It got him some yards. But, you know, it's a sound run fit. You just typically want to cut the front a little bit to push the ball out. Now, you had mentioned the four eyes. You watch some of their stuff where they're playing two man and they're going to be short in the run game. But the four eye to the side of the back is able to knock the tackle back and get basically set the edge from the inside out. And when you get that type of four eye play and, and you're on the back side, you think about it, that's the one where the back they played the front side back or the front side C, the back side back or played the A gap off the lag nose. And you know, you feel like the back's able to jump cut to the C gap and then it's one on one with the safety of ten yards. But when the four eye can knock the tackle back and he can set the edge inside out and force the back to stay front side where you're gapped out, that can be pretty effective in a run game. And once you can play short in a run game, I mean, you can stop pretty much anybody's pass game. You know, if you got a decent plan, you, you're willing and able, I say willing, but more able than anything to play short in the run game and stop the run, then, you know, you really have, have something cooking for, for that. You did mention in the beginning, but I know you wanted to make a few points about their man coverage as well. Yeah, so, you know, they could have been in more of a match third or man, but they got four verts out of two by two ten personnel at one point. And, you know, it was interesting because I, I played – in the past, and, and I get it, if you're, especially if you're in cover three, what I would call hash divider rules. And the number two receivers on both sides for Tennessee are typically split right on the divider. So, you know, Georgia played them shaded, you know, I would say five eye or six eyes, you know, six yards deep inside eye or five yards deep inside eye. And they allowed those guys to run the seams you know, outside release. And I think everybody probably, if you watch the game, you probably remember the one they, uh, the guy that can really run for Tennessee. I can't remember his name, but they missed him on the deep ball. They overthrew it. And, and they gave him an outside release, and either, either man free or cover three, whatever it was. He was just the, the nickel was the scene player on that guy. And I just thought it was interesting. Like you're not using the post safety at that point anymore. And, and I do understand it kind of a rule breaker for some people because he split so wide. You don't want to put your guy all the way out there. You think that, you know, if, we can jam them and widen them and then, you know, we'll get some help maybe from the corner and then the safety got to, got to push to get, get his width. But I did think it was interesting because I've been in that conundrum before too. They oversplit too. And you want to say, all right, Hey, we're not going to chase them all the way out there. We're going to slide play inside leverage of them that way. You know, if they want to go two man bubble game or something out there, it's going to be harder for the, the number one receiver to come crack us, that type of thing. But, you know, I did think it was um, just an interesting thing to look at. Like, you still can get four verts with those wide splits, and that's exactly what they got, and the ball should have been completed. It really could have been a touchdown if the ball was thrown on point. And it was just one of those rule breakers and something that I noticed I think is a good point to, to bring up. So that takes us into the last segment of our show every week, and that's some of the option tips. And in this particular game, you got two option teams going, Army and Air Force. 
I love to watch the, the academies play each other. Obviously, the Army Navy game is you know something takes place at the end of the year every year, and you know usually we're nobody's really playing that weekend, so everybody can get a chance to sit down and watch it. But they will do things offensively that they don't do normally. So there, there's a lot of it. Is it maybe the best tape to watch all the time for for somebody? going against an academy or a triple option team. But I will say there's a couple of things you could see. And I like to watch it because Army, defensively, they're going to know what they think is successful against option offenses and vice versa with Air Force. So the first thing early in the game, you notice Army playing a tight nine to Air Force's tight end. And that way they can spill the G lead play. And they did the first time they ran a tight end block down, got crushed tight end down, stayed in the D gap, spilled the guard, backer scraped over, backer scraped a little too tight and kind of picked himself off. But the play was set up perfectly to hit it for, you know, for plus two and efficient play. So, you know, talk about that a lot. If you're going to get G lead, if you're going to get tight end on the ball and they're going to run G lead, they're getting a nine technique to get the guard spilled. So he can't get out and around and get turned up the field and turn his shoulders and start pushing people down the field. So army doing it kind of reinforces how I feel about it. And I think how a lot of people should feel about it is if you're going to get G lead, you're going to get hand on the ball tight end from an option team. You need to get a nine technique to crush that guy down and spill the guard. The other thing is, you know, they were in a three, four structure army. They did some different things with their four eyes. Sometimes those guys would chase down off the guards veer block. They would come really hard and crash for the midline play, or they would crash for, we'll talk about the kind of zone dive in a minute, but they would crash really hard. But then on any type of tackle arc or tackle, what I call horn block outside, they would sit as a quarterback player. So, which is, is a fine way to fit it. That's not, you know, I don't think that's unsound in any way, but you have to understand what you're inviting there and you're inviting now you're inviting midline and midline insert and trap, and they end up getting them all, right? So they horn the tackle, and then they were starting to motion the guy back in. The uh, slot would be flexed out. They'd motion him into the B gap. They would horn the tackle. And that guy would fire through the gap. Fullback would come right off his butt, and now you're asking the safety come down from depth and make that play on the fullback who's vertical right through there. And you know, they made some yards on it. They really did. So just know, like, Everything you do in, is getting watched when you play an option team. Every little nuance of your defensive line, your linebackers, your safeties, and how they're fitting is being watched. So as soon as you start widening a four-eye, an inside-out player with a horn block, you're going to get traps. You're going to get inserts. You're going to get midline that way, okay? And they're going to do that. So now who's got to fit what? Does the horn block mean that the four-eye takes over the responsibility of the inside backer to that side? And now the inside backer got to play downhill? That's one way to do it. Okay, does the four eye as soon as he sees horn, he still chases off the butt of the guard. Doesn't matter to him. He's still got to play that. Now you're asking the backer to scrape and make a decision on the horn block. Can I get over top? No. Okay, stay underneath of it and now widen back out once I get underneath of it. So all those are things that you have to go through when you're fitting those things. And but the important part is seeing something like that on film when you're like and this is why I stress, watch the tape of the structure you're gonna be in. So if I'm a three four defense, I'm playing a triple option team, I see that right there okay, how are we playing these four eyes? Are we susceptible to getting the midline insert? If we are, all right, safety's got to understand that. That's a play that's coming. they got to match that, that slot on their side, come downhill, and it's going to be their tackle to make. So, you know, all the, the yin and yang of, of everything that you do, they have an answer for, and there's a play that they like off of it. And that's why you know, you got to watch so much tape of the same structure that you're going to be in. And the last thing you see in Air Force, I believe Air Force's version of the option is probably – maybe the more modern version or just uh, has a little bit more to it and a lot more motion in and out of the formation, like guys coming from out of the core to in and, and vice versa motion it out you know, wide to be slots. So they give you a little bit more to deal with. They were making some yards on this zone dive play. And if you're going to play the backside backer on the fullback, right off the midline action, which so many of us try to do, get the front side backer to the alley, the backside backer off the dive, you got to be able to recognize the difference between midline pass in a zone dive coming at him because what happened to Army's backside backer a couple of times is he got out leveraged by the gap because they were running almost like zone, almost like a stretch type zone going out. And he was just sitting there waiting for the fullback, but he was fullback was taking it all the way behind him. So, you know, recognizing those plays early on and just being able to coach through that stuff on the sideline because they were making pretty easy yards off the zone dive and the Army's backside backer the first couple of times played it more like it was midline pass. And they weren't able to maybe recognize the difference in the past. So, you know, I just thought that as these offenses, they don't have the same tools they used to have with all the cut blocks and things. They can't do everything they used to do. They're going to continue to evolve. They're going to continue to, to come up with different things. And, you know, you see a lot more zone dive with the fullback. And um, you got to recognize the difference between that and the midline path. 
And that's the fun part of this game, that we get to continue to find ways to evolve regardless of what side we're on. And you know, that's what we see really over the course of any season is some things really become trendy and, and start to evolve. And you figure out, well, why, are, why is everybody running this this year? And, and you know, that's, those are some of the things we talked about uh, over the course of the year. And always fun, always fun to watch, study, see what we can learn from it. And as always, you did a great job in putting this episode together as well. Appreciate it, Keith. It's, you know, one of the highlights of my week to be able to come on here and talk some football and hopefully somebody gets something out of it.